Good morning everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again today. Welcome to Worship and the Word with us here at Church of the True Vine. I pray that God will richly bless you today as we spend this time together. I'm going to begin by reading from Psalm 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. What a wonderful promise from God's word. Blessed is the man who trusts in you. Our God blesses those who trust in him. He is wonderful. We trust in the Lord our God because he has proven himself to be trustworthy. Romans 5 8 tells us that God demonstrates his own love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't just say that he loves us. He has proved it by giving his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross. That is why we know that we can trust every word that he speaks. And he has promised that we may ask anything in the name of Jesus and it will be done. We may ask anything according to his will. We're praying today, as we always do, for the persecuted church. Every week we pray for different nations around the world where Christians are persecuted simply for being followers of Jesus Christ. And today we're praying for Christians in the nation of Mauritania. The World Watch List booklet says this regarding what life is like for Christians in Mauritania. In Mauritania, it is illegal to leave Islam and follow another faith. Converts face extreme pressure for bringing shame on their families. They are likely to be shunned or abused. They may be accused of apostasy in a religious court with severe consequences or prosecuted for undermining national security by insulting Islam and threatening Mauritania's sacred principles. It is extremely risky for Christians to meet together. Even foreign-born Christians worshipping publicly can be charged with trying to evangelise Muslims. Please join with us later on as we pray together for our brothers and sisters in Mauritania. And we continue, of course, to pray regarding this awful war in Ukraine. But now let's turn our attention to worshipping our God. Come, now is the time to worship. God bless you as we give praise and glory to our Lord this morning. God bless you. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to Just as you are to worship, come just.
just as you are before your God. Good morning. Today I'll be reading to you from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Yabok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and everything else that he had. And Jacob was alone, and a man wrestled with him, until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on a sinew of the thigh. This is a quite extraordinary incident in the life of Jacob that we find here in Genesis chapter 32. This is what most scholars call a theophany, that is a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus Christ on the earth. Thousands of years before 
Jesus comes, the word becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us. Thousands of years before that, Jesus appears in bodily form to Jacob and they wrestle together. It's a critical moment in the life of Jacob. Up until this point, Jacob has established something of a reputation for himself and it's not a good reputation. Jacob was the younger brother of Esau. They were both the sons of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. As the oldest brother, Esau was the one who was due to receive the birthright and who should have received the blessing of the oldest son from his father Isaac. But Jacob deceives Esau. And so Esau is tricked into surrendering his birthright to Jacob. And then later on, as Isaac is coming near to his death, he wants to bless his oldest son. And so he sends him out to hunt for game. But, uh, but their mother says to Jacob, dress yourself as him. I will make his favorite uh, stew of meat and you give him that and because his eyesight is bad he will not know that it's you and you can get his blessing for you and so Jacob deceives Isaac into giving him the blessing that is due to Esau. Esau when he finds out what Jacob has done swears that he will kill him and so Jacob runs from Esau. He then ends up in the household of Laban and he falls in love with Laban, that's his uncle. He falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. But Laban turns the tables on Jacob. Jacob is the one who's been doing the lying up to this point. Laban says, if you want to marry my daughter, Rachel, you have to work for me for seven years. And at the end of that time, I will give you my daughter, Rachel, as your wife. And so Jacob does this and it says it seemed like it was just a day. So great was his love for Rachel. But on the wedding night, when all is dark, Laban takes his oldest daughter, Leah, and he puts a veil over her face and he sends her in to Jacob to be his wife. And then Jacob has to work another seven years so that he can have Rachel as his wife. Things have not gone well for Jacob and then he ends up in dispute with Laban and he, he ends up leaving Laban's household. And now he is at the point in his life where he is about to meet his brother again. He is in a place of fear. He is in a place of desperation. Because he knows what his brother has sworn and so he sends gifts ahead of him to try and appease his brother before they meet. And during the night he has this meeting with this man with whom he wrestles. This is the critical turning point in Jacob's life. Because here we see in verse 24, it says, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. This is a man. This is what is so extraordinary about this account. This is a man, a normal human being. There was nothing superhuman about Jacob. This is an ordinary man like you, like me, wrestling with God and prevailing in that wrestling. It is only when God touches the socket of his hip that God overcomes Jacob. And yet even then, Jacob will not let go. He clings to him. He says, I will not let you go unless you you bless me. Jacob typifies so many of us. You know, God has given us a free will. And for so many of us, before we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior, many of us, and I include myself in this, 
will wrestle with God. We will not give in to God. We refuse to bow down to God. We refuse to surrender to God. And it takes something where God has to show us our weakness, our humanity, our desperate need of a saviour for us to come and surrender our lives to him. But until that point, our will, amazingly enough, God has allowed this, our will can be strong enough to resist God. That is why many people will go into a lost eternity because they wrestled with God and overcame, did not surrender. The problem with that is that God brings us to that point of wrestling for a reason. And the reason is because up until that point, we will not be walking in the blessing of being children of God. We will not be walking in the blessing of those who have been saved. We will not be walking in the blessing of everlasting life. We will not be walking in the blessing of having a covenant with Almighty God, where every one of his promises is 100% guaranteed to us because whatever God has promised, it finds its yes and its amen in Christ Jesus. I fought against God for a long time, but eventually he got me to the point where I surrendered my life to him. And I'm not going to tell you that it's been plain sailing from that point on, but I know now that I have an eternal destiny that is guaranteed. I have a place in heaven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I do not have fear of judgment when I leave this life and I can walk in the blessing of God in this life. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus said, surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What a privilege to walk with God, to have Jesus with you to be reconciled to the heavenly father forgiven of your sin saved from condemnation in a place called hell so many people wrestle with god they refuse to yield their will unto his and they lose out jesus once said what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul we can cling to what we think is precious in this life we can cling to what we think is valuable because we think if we surrender to god we're going to have to give all of that up if god needs you to give it up then you shouldn't have it in the first place because it is not the place of true blessing. Once a rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to inherit everlasting life? And Jesus looked at him and he loved him. He said, you must follow the commandments. He told him which commandments. And this man said, I followed all of these commandments, but what do I still lack? And Jesus turned to this rich young ruler and he said, go sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasures in heaven you will have an eternal reward but this rich young ruler went away sad because his wealth was very great that's when jesus turned to the disciples this is how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle jesus doesn't ask us to surrender things just because he's mean Jesus calls upon us to surrender our lives to him because he has blessing in store for us. And until we surrender to him, then we will not walk in that blessing. We will not enter in to everlasting life. We will not enter in to freedom from judgment. We will not enter in to the blessing of almighty God. We will not enter in to the riches of the kingdom of heaven. We will not receive the crown that is offered to those who overcome in this life. Jesus says, whoever would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. 
Taking up your cross doesn't mean being miserable, but it does mean surrendering your will to his. And that is the situation that Jacob is in now. Up until this point in his life, he has been known as Jacob. Jacob means supplanter or deceiver. But as he is clinging to God, he's saying, I will not let go unless you bless me. Suddenly he realizes his total dependence upon God. I've tried so hard up till this point. I've tried to do things my own way up to this point, And I'm looking at the debris of my life now. And I'm, 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 I'm desperately trying to hold on. But I know that I cannot be blessed unless you, God, bless me. That means having to let go of what is past. And God says to him, the man says to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then the man who we know is God says to him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Jacob means deceiver or supplanter. That is who Jacob has been up till this point. That is his identity up until this point. But God says you're not going to be called that anymore. That is not your identity anymore. From now on, you are going to be called Israel. Israel means wrestles with God, but it also means prince of God. What a change. Deceiver, prince of God. When God steps into your life and he changes your name, when he changes your identity, when you surrender to him, he gives you a new identity. And that identity is good. That identity then shapes your entire destiny. You see this with Abraham, Jacob's grandfather. If you turn to Genesis chapter 17, Abram is elderly. And his wife, Sarai, is elderly. Sarai is barren and she's well past the age of childbearing. But God promises Abraham, I am going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. And if you go to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 4, God says this to Abraham. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. How is that possible? Abraham is old, his wife is old and barren. But God changes his name from Abram, which means an exalted father, to Abraham, the father of many nations. He changes his identity. Up until this point, Abram has simply been known as an exalted father. People have known that he's old. People have known that he doesn't have children. That's been his identity. But God gives him a new name, a new identity. And with that new identity comes a blessing, comes a promise that God is going to multiply Abraham's descendants after him. As many as the stars in the sky, if you can count them, as many as the grains of sand on the seashore, if you can count them, that is how many Abraham's descendants will be. And Abraham's wife, Sarai, her name means my princess, my princess, the princess of Abraham, belonging to one man. But God says, I'm going to change your name to Sarah, Sarah. If you go to verse 15 of Genesis 17, it says, God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai. 
but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I shall bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. From this moment on, from the moment that God changes her name from Sarai to Sarah, now she conceives, she gives birth to a son, and through her, the promise to Abraham is fulfilled as she becomes princess, the princess. Change of name means a new identity, it means a new destiny. When we wrestle with God, when we try to cling on to our own reputation, when we try to cling on to our own way, when we try to cling on to our own style of doing things, when we try to cling on to our traditions, when we try to cling on to anything that would hold us back, God comes, he wrestles with us and he says, will you surrender? Will you surrender? He's not doing it because he's got it in for you. He's doing it because he longs to bless you. But until you surrender your will to his, you will not enter in to the fullness of the destiny that God has for you. God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you and not to harm you. Plans to prosper you. Plans for good and not for harm. But we have to surrender to him. I have learned through my Christian life that when you try to do things your own way, it doesn't work. But when you surrender, when you yield to him, when you say, God, I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. I'm not going to seek my own blessing. I'm not going to try and make it all happen for myself. I'm not going to try and make myself successful. I'm not going to try and make myself great. I'm not going to try and live life according to my own way anymore. I'm clinging to you now, Lord, and I'm not letting go because I need that blessing from you. When you come to that point, God says, now you're ready to walk in my blessing now you are ready to walk in my purpose now you are ready to to fulfill the commission the calling the blessings that i have placed upon your life now you are a child that i can use now i can bless you now i can bless you if you're wrestling with god today maybe you're wrestling because you know that what Jesus says is true, but you still want to cling to your own way of life. If you do that, you will be lost. But if you come and surrender to Jesus, then you will discover for yourself the richness and the blessing that comes in following him and you will receive the gift of everlasting life. If you are a follower of Jesus, but he's calling you to drop something to give something up to yield something to him but it's precious to you know today that if you will surrender it to him even things that have been blessed even things that have been good and god's saying time to let that go when you let that go then you enter into the fullness of his blessing for you it's called being humble before god Anything other than that is called being stiff-necked. God says, I give grace to the humble, but the proud I look upon from afar. Yield to God. If you're at a point in your life when you are wrestling with him, yield, surrender to him. I guarantee you, you will not lose out even though your flesh might be screaming at you you will not lose out because when you yield to god you open yourself up to a new destiny jacob went from the identity of the deceiver the supplanter to the destiny of prince of god 
yield to the Lord and see what the Lord will do. And now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your promise that we may ask anything in your name and it will be done. And we may ask anything according to your will and it will be done. And so, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus to pray for our brothers and sisters in Mauritania. Father, I pray that you would enable them to stand strong in the face of persecution, in the face of threat, whether that's threat of violence, threat of religious courts, threat of being ostracized by family and community. Lord, I pray that you would enable them to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. Please help them to stand firm in their faith. And Lord, I do pray that you would enable them to find ways of meeting together. If it has to be in secret, Lord, I pray that you would keep them safe from prying eyes. You would keep them safe from any who would try to infiltrate so they can report them. Lord, I pray that you would command your angels according to your word to guard them in all their ways. Lord, I pray that you would help them receive the support, the aid that they need. Pray that they would be able to get hold of Bibles. Pray that they would be able to get hold of good teaching to strengthen them in their faith. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to give them boldness in sharing the gospel, even in the face of what they are experiencing. Bless them today, Lord, I pray in Jesus name and please bring about a change in the laws of Mauritania so that Christians will be able to meet together and worship you publicly and openly. Father we pray again regarding this war in Ukraine. Father we pray knowing that you are God who makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth and Lord this war is no different. You are able to bring this war to an end. So, Lord, that is what we're asking for. We pray that you would bring this war to an end, that you would cause hostilities, conflict to cease in Jesus' name, that no more blood would be shed, that no more innocent lives would be lost. Lord, we pray that evil would not be seen to triumph. Where evil has flourished, Lord, we pray that you would bring it down. Lord, may righteousness truth and good be seen to prevail most of all though father we pray that this war would come to an end that you would cause it to come to an end we ask it in the name of jesus amen amen thank you for joining us today it's been great having you with us i pray that you have been blessed if there's anything that you would like prayer for, then please do get in touch. We would love to pray with you, pray for you and help you in whatever way we can. Most of all, if you want to know more about what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then please get in touch. I can guarantee you one thing. Following Jesus can be hard. Following Jesus can be difficult, but it is only through Jesus Christ that we may receive everlasting life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And if you would like to know how to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Saviour, then please just get in touch. Maybe you're ready to take that step right now. Let me ask you one question. Do you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead? If you do truly believe that, then I would ask you to do one more thing. That is to confess Jesus as Lord. That doesn't just mean saying it out loud. It means taking what you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and saying, because of that, I will commit myself to following Jesus for the rest of my days. He is now my Lord 
and I will follow him. I will confess him publicly as my Lord, no matter what, for the rest of my days. If that's you, then I can help you by praying a prayer. Praying this prayer in itself will not save you. It's just to help you if you believe in your heart God has raised Jesus from the dead and if you are truly willing to confess him as Lord and follow him for the rest of your days. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe that you gave your son Jesus Christ to die for me. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the Son of God who entered into this dark world, lived a sinless life, but then laid down your life on the cross for me. I know that I am a sinner. I know that I cannot save myself. But Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have died my death for me. You have taken all the punishment for my sin as you shed your blood on the cross for me. I believe that you are risen from the dead. I believe it with all my heart. And I confess now, Jesus, you are Lord. I surrender my life to you. I commit myself as far as I am able to follow you, to love you, to serve you for the rest of my days, confessing you as my Lord. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit, to enable me, to strengthen me as I follow you. I turn away from my old life. I'm sorry for my sin. I ask you to wash me clean and make me fit for the kingdom of heaven. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing this prayer and for saving me as I believe in you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, then please do get in touch. Or if there is anything that you require prayer for, please get in touch. We love to pray for people. We love to pray with people and see what God does in their circumstances and in their situations. He is a great and mighty God and with him all things are possible. If you're anywhere in the Clevedon area, we meet at the community centre on Prince's Road. That's at 10.30 every Sunday morning. If you're not in the Clevedon area, please still get in touch anyway. We would love to hear from you. We're back here again on YouTube at the same time next week. That's 10 a.m. UK time. So until then, may God bless you and keep you. Bye-bye.